Hello everyone. Today's reflection comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. Again, that's Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, if you want to grab your Bible and follow along. Uh, let me open an, an opening prayer. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. We present ourselves to you at this time, Lord God, that you may open our ears to hear your word, that you may open our minds to understand your word, that you may open our hearts to receive your word, that we may come away changed and with a greater love for you and a greater desire to obey you and do the things that you have called us to do. For it is for your glory, and it's in Jesus' name that we ask. Amen. So we're at Matthew once again, Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. And here's what it says. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to the least of one of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So this passage is the final section of the Olivet Discourse, which starts with Matthew 24, about the second or third verse, and in this discourse, Jesus speaks about the destruction of the temple, the signs of his coming, and the end of the age. And it ends with today's passage. Now, while there is much in this discourse to keep our minds occupied, especially with regard to the signs of the times and their relation to the Lord's return, we would do well to give our attention to the things in the discourse that are directed to the church, such as endurance, alertness, discernment, preparedness, faithfulness, and stewardship. Now, last week we read from the parable of the talents, which exhorts us to faithfully steward the gifts which God has equipped us with to carry out his work until he returns. Today's reading, however, is not a parable. Jesus is not speaking metaphorically or abstractly, he is speaking plainly of a future event known as Judgment Day, or the Final Judgment. This is an actual day that has been fixed by the Father. 
This is not like the judgment warnings of the Old Testament, where God would delay or forego judgment if the people would heed the warnings and repent, uh, such as Nineveh. You can read about that in the book of Jonah. This is not an earthly judgment, as we see throughout the scriptures, that comes in the form of plagues or natural disasters or conquering nations. This judgment occurs in heaven. And this is a final judgment judgment, the determination, the results are eternal, and the opportunity for repentance and turning to God has passed. I hope you realize that. When you come to this judgment, the opportunity for repentance, the opportunity to turn from your sins, the opportunity to turn to God has already passed. It's already too late for those who have not turned to God in Christ. So knowing that a final judgment is coming should provide us, it should provide the church with a sense of urgency when it comes to sharing the gospel with others, because time is running out. When the Apostle Paul was in Athens, and you can read about this in Acts chapter 17, he told the men of Athens the following. He said, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now... He commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Well, when you hear by raising him from the dead, who do you think of? You think of Jesus and you would be correct. So, again, looking at today's passage, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, he will sit on his glorious throne, and he will judge those that are in front of him. We see that the judge, at the final judgment, the judge is Jesus, the Son of Man. Son of Man is the way that Jesus refers to himself most often in the Gospels, 26 times in Matthew's Gospel alone. So, Son of Man is not a, it's not an expression of Jesus' humanity. It is an expression of his divine authority. You can read that in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 14. The Son of Man is given dominion and glory in a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. This description, this is the Jesus of Scripture who will break and rule the nations with a rod of iron. And he is the one who will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. I'll give you some scripture references for your further study. Psalm chapter 2 verse 9. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5, and again in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 15, we read of these things of the Son of Christ who will break and rule the nations with a rod of iron and tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. This is not the pop culture Jesus that we have plastered all over t-shirts and bumper stickers and on various tchotchkes and jewelry, you know, things that make Jesus our best friend, but not necessarily Lord. This Jesus described in Scripture is the Son of Man that John the Apostle saw in all his glory in the first chapter of Revelation, and upon seeing him, fell at his feet as though dead. It is this Son of Man, in all his glory, who will return and sit on his glorious throne to judge the living and the dead, as it says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. It is this Son of Man to whom the Father has given all judgment, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. That's in John chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. So now that we're clear on who the judge is, Let's be clear on what happens at the judgment. Well, the nations will be gathered, and the people will be separated before the Son of Man, 
as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. The sheep will inherit the kingdom prepared from them, and the goats will be sent into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Very clear distinction of heaven and hell. And note, this is important, note that the separation of the sheep and goats happens before Jesus addresses each group. There is no examination to see who qualifies as a sheep and who doesn't. So if you're waiting to die, if you're waiting till you appear before God to see if he determines whether or not you're going into heaven or not, it's already too late. There is no examination to see who qualifies as a sheep and who doesn't. When the Lord addresses them after separating them, when the Lord addresses them, it is for the purpose of pronouncing judgment. Jesus already knows who his sheep are because they have been given to him by his Father. In John chapter 10 and in John chapter 17, he says, Yours they were, and you gave them to me. The separation of sheep and goats is not based on works or merit, but on God's mercy in election. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. If you want to read more about election, I would suggest you go to the, uh, the ninth chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. So, getting back to sheep and goats, well, why the imagery of sheep and goats? Well, why sheep? Well, the image of God's people as sheep is found in places like Psalm 95 and verse 7 and Psalm 100 and verse 3, where it says, we are the sheep of his pasture. Also in Ezekiel 34, where God clearly refers to his people as his sheep. Jesus also explicitly refers to his followers as his sheep in John chapter 10. Now, looking at the goats, well, why goats? Well, here's an interesting thing. In the 16th chapter of Leviticus, where God is giving instructions for the Day of Atonement, the high priest would lay his hands on the head of a goat, referred to as a scapegoat or a zazel. He would lay his hands on the head of the, the scapegoat, confess over this goat all of the iniquities, transgressions, and sins of the people of Israel, and then the goat would be sent out of the camp into the wilderness, bearing the sins of the people. Now, as sheep, the believer's sins have been born and paid for by Christ, the Lamb of God. But for the goats, and the goats are those who reject Christ, they will have to bear their sin for eternity. Just as the scapegoat was sent into the wilderness bearing the sins of the people, the goats at the judgment are sent to bear their own sins for eternity. But they're not just sent away, they are sent into the lake of fire. You can read about that more in Revelation chapter 19, verse 20, and chapter 20 and verse 15. They are sent into the lake of fire bearing their own sins where they will bear their sins and their punishment for eternity. So Jesus will say to the goats, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Again, if you are listening to this, you're, you hear my voice now, and you know you're not a Christian, this is what awaits you if you do not accept Christ. If you do not accept Christ's payment for your sin, and take him as Savior, as Lord, you will have to bear your sins into eternity. So moving on through today's passage, getting back to Matthew 25, what about the works? Because Jesus says, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And the righteous answer him, Lord, when did we see these things? When did we, when did we see you hungry in the situations? Well, the question that comes up that many ask is, well, doesn't feeding the hungry or giving the thirsty something to drink 
welcoming the stranger, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, and going to those in prison, doesn't that count for anything? And who are the hungry? Who are the thirsty? Who are the strangers, the naked, the sick, and the prisoners? Who are they? Well, let's look at the works. Well, first of all, the works that Jesus cites here are not works that gain us entry into the kingdom. Remember, the separation of the sheep from the goats has already occurred. So the works that Jesus cites are not works that gain us entry into the kingdom. And how do we know that? Well, here are a few reminders. You might want to write these down. In Titus chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, it says that he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that by being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life not by works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, he saved us. Again, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, reminds us that our works serve as evidence of saving faith. So it's not the works that get us in, it's God's mercy that gets us into heaven. Now, don't get me wrong, while showing compassion to the poor and the hungry, has merit and is in line with Scripture, don't think that we're off the hook, we need to be, we need to be clear about to whom Jesus is referring in this particular passage that we're looking at today. So you ask me, to whom is Jesus referring? Well, the key is here in his statement. He says, truly I say to you, as you did it, to one of the least of these, my brothers, underline that, you did it to me, underline that as well. So, the key here is the least of these, my brothers. So, Romans chapter 8 and verses 29, I'll give you some references here for you to look up. Romans 8.29 refers to Jesus as the firstborn of many brothers. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 11, it refers to those in Christ as the sanctified. And it says that Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers. Here's another one. In Acts chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, Jesus meets Saul on the road to Damascus during the height of Saul's persecution against the church. And what does the Lord say to Saul when Saul asks him, Who are you? Who are you, Lord? Jesus tells him, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. When Jesus first stopped Saul, he asked Saul a question. He says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So, when we read today's texts from Matthew 25, in the light of these verses, which we just reviewed, we see that Jesus is referring to his church. He's referring to his sheep. He is referring to those who are part of the body of Christ. So what then does he mean? Since the Lord is referring to the members of his body, the church, the acts of kindness that he is referring to in Matthew 25 is the love that Jesus commands us to have for one another. That's the new commandment he gave us in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. That love for one another, again, it doesn't merit us a place in heaven. Rather, it is evidence of the saving grace of God in our lives that is evidenced by our works, as explained again by James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. It is evidence of our obedience to the command of Christ. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So, what does all this mean 
for us? Well, the time of the final judgment is fixed. Let's be clear about that. The outcome of that judgment is eternal. Let's be clear about that as well. So for us, it means that with each passing day, the opportunities to warn others of the coming judgment grow shorter. It means that the opportunities to let others know of God's command to repent grow shorter. It means that the opportunities to let others know of the salvation that is available through Christ alone grows shorter. So let us continue to be diligent. In fact, we should step up our efforts in our witness for Christ. It should also bring us clarity in our gospel message. You know, it's perhaps it's not enough to say God loves you and has a wonderful plan to, for your life. You know, while there's truth in that, we need to instill a sense of urgency, and it's a real sense of urgency, that one day you will die. One day you will stand before God in the great judgment. Will you be in Christ or will you not be in Christ? Because the eternal consequences are real. And what, 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 where do we come in here? Well, we have been tasked with making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that Jesus has commanded us. So it's time for us to lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely and run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of faith, that we may carry out the commission that he has given to us to make disciples of all nations. Now again, you might be hearing this, and you might say, this doesn't apply to me, I'm not a Christian. Well, it does. Because if you have not turned from your sin, to place your faith in Christ, I urge you, don't wait. For now is the day is salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, through the word of God, do not harden your heart. So you need to come now. Why? Because time is running out, and you do not know if you will see tomorrow. Tomorrow is not promised to any of us. And a final scripture from Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. If you're waiting, again, if you are not in Christ, if you are not a Christian, and you're waiting until you die to let God weigh your good deeds and bad deeds, it will be too late. You must come to Christ today. You must come to Christ while you still have breath in your lungs and your heart is still beating. You must come to him now, for there will be no second chances. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the clarity of your word. We thank you that it is not ambiguous, Lord, to leave us to figure out what might happen after we die. In your mercy and in your grace, you let us know what happens after we die. You let us know what awaits us. And you let us know that there is salvation available in Christ. Father, I pray for all those who might hear this message today, who are not in Christ, that they would consider carefully, that they would consider seriously, that they would urgently consider their eternal state before you and that you would draw them by your spirit and make them your children, sons and daughters all, that they may be with the sheep who inherit the kingdom prepared for us from the foundation of the earth. And for those of us, your people, those of us who call upon you as Savior and Lord, we thank you for your great salvation. But we pray, Lord, that you would fill us, Lord, with your spirit and give us Lord, the urgency that we need, the boldness that we need, the word that we need to go forth, proclaim your gospel, and make disciples of all nations, as you have commanded us to do. 
And this we pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, for your glory alone. Amen.